All right. Welcome, everyone, to History Talks. I'm Rhiannon Luna, the Executive Director over at the Gas Lamp Quarter Historical Foundation. I want to welcome you to our monthly lecture series and thank Kit Goldman for coming to talk. Kit was one the founder of the Hork and Grand Theater and is going to tell us that fascinating story tonight. <laughs> so go ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to apologize. I've been told because I'm wired for sound and being videoed, I, I can't move over there, which would be my natural inclination. So I got to kind of stay put. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm really, I'm excited and I'm delighted um, to be here to share the story of the theater next door and its sister theater, which stood up the block and across the street, and what's embedded in those theaters' DNA. Um, I've written it down. I had to write it down. Um, and I'm going to kind of work off the written page, because if I went off the cuff, believe me, we would be here all night, right? <laughs> which wouldn't be so bad, because we're at the Horton Grand Hotel. So <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that might be a good option. Also, I have a few visuals, only a few. Um, that was what I was able to put together. Um, it's kind of minimal, um, but at least you're not. I'm in the training business for the last two and a half years, and we joke about death by PowerPoint. Well, you're not at any risk for that tonight. Um, as we go through this, um, please feel free if you've got questions or thoughts uh, mid talk, go ahead and, and uh, speak up, and then we'll do a QA uh, at the end as well. So, okay, folks, here's the story. The Horton Grand Theater, originally called the Dean Theater, and then the Han Cosmopolitan opened its doors on December 29th, 1986. It was built on the site of a 1912 San Diego paper box factory, and it was built as a residence for the Gas Lamp Quarter Theater Company, which I founded in 1979 with director Will Simpson and designer Robert Earle. And in 1987, we launched our first season in that theater, and it was four shows, and those shows were Somerset Mom's The Circle, Sheila Delaney's A Taste of Honey, Larry Shue's The Foreigner, and Tom Stoppard's The Real Thing. Now this was the second playhouse that we built in Gaslamp. And our first was the 96-seat Gaslamp Quarter Theater, which we opened in May of 1980 up the street at 547 Fourth Avenue. We were right across from the old Royal Pie Bakery, which was run by Alex Cannell. Some of you may remember Alex. And the theater, the Gas Lamp Theater, was built on the site of an old Chinese dance hall and favored mahjong venue. And it was on the ground floor of the Pacifica Hotel, which was a single room occupancy hotel, and it was formerly the Siri. Now, I have to share something kind of personal with you. And Linda, our, my friend here, was with me that night. I have to tell you that in anticipation of this talk, I set foot in the Horton Grand Theater for the first time in the 25 years since I left it. And one of the reasons historic buildings are so compelling is all of the life that has flowed through them. And there was a lot of life that went on in that theater creating the theater and filling it night after night with entertainment was an amazing chapter and it was fraught with emotions all across the board and i chose during those 25 years to keep those emotions at bay kind of like not wanting to run into an old lover that you still had feelings for we can <laughs> probably all relate to that right <clears throat> however i came down uh, the other night to meet this lovely woman, Linda Ibarra, who was our photographer at the beginning stages of our theater, our production photographer, and I wanted to go through some archives with Linda. So I got there early, and uh, we were going to have a cocktail and do some reminiscing, and I saw there was a show loading into the theater, and uh, Copley Alley, the gate was open, and the stage door was open, and I went down Copley Alley, which, by the way, we named... Uh, in honor of Helen Copley, got a $100,000 donation from her for the theater to do that. And I walked through that stage door and onto the stage, and I'll tell you, it was, uh, there was a tsunami of memories that came uh, crashing on shore. And as I stood there, a young man came out of the audience and uh, asked, can I help you? And I told him 
that we'd built the theater and he introduced himself and he was the technical director of the San Diego Musical Theater, a very fine company which is now producing there. And uh, we chatted. And I have to tell you, I, I walked out of there filled with joy. <laughs> that it was such a beautiful theater and a theater I gave birth to and it was looking good and it was doing exactly what it was born to do. So, that said, let me uh, set the stage for how that came to be. And forgive me, hello. hello. You're gonna hear about this woman right here. <laughs> forgive me if I, if I go way back, but I'm gonna go all the way back to where the story actually started, okay? I grew up in Hollywood. I was a latchkey kid with a single working mom who was an executive secretary to bring home the bacon. She was a fabulous actress and a wonderful writer, but she put that aside to support the family. And when I was eight, I produced my first show. I went around the uh, neighborhood and gathered a bunch of kids and brought them to my backyard and had my cats perform. And uh, <laughs> so I was a little producer, but I, I was also a performer. Now my mom's job transferred her to San Diego when I was in the 11th grade and I entered Point Loma High School and I performed in all the plays and after graduating I got a couple of waitress jobs and uh, um, at 19 I got married, I got a job at the Union Tribune which I would leave 15 years later after we opened the first theater. I had a son, I got divorced, I enrolled at San Diego State University, got my degree in early childhood education and um, I was a single working mom living in Mission Beach. I was doing shows around town, acting at City College, um, acting at different community theaters, and getting my feet wet as a producer in a little company um, up in Del Mar. And um, when I graduated in 76, I had a great career path in education, and it would have been a real steady income for me and my son. And um, I was very conflicted because theater was calling to me, and my gut was telling me go all in. And I have been one to follow my gut. So in 1977, with the feminist movement in full swing, I and my mom and some fellow actresses started the Women's <coughs> Theater Ensemble. And so we were producing shows by and about women all over town, venues, and we landed at the Second Avenue Theater, which was a 49-seat space in the old Knights of Pythias building. Some of you may remember that. It was a demolished for Horton Plaza. It was on E Street and had been turned into community arts by a powerhouse arts activist from San Francisco named June Gutfleisch, and she had it. It was a, basically a, a beehive, like a warren of all these different nascent art groups, aspiring art groups, where they were producing and pollinating. And Will and Bob, who became my partners, there you go. Right. There's Willie and Bobby, okay? <laughs> they became my partners and later designed the Horton Grand Theater with gas lamp ar architect Wayne Donaldson. Now, um, Willie and Bobby had designed that Second Avenue space, so we began working together. They were also director and designer. So we started doing shows together at the Second Avenue. Bob designing, Willie directing, and me acting and producing. And I had taken over an existing 501c3 theater corporation. So in 79, we did several shows at that little Second Avenue theater. And we packed it to the brim with a show called Uncommon Women and Others by Wendy Wasserstein, a show about seven college roommates who get together after. And uh, we were a big hit. We wanted to extend it, but uh, we shared the space with others. And so we, we began to chomp at the bit, wanting to get our own space. And I became a woman obsessed looking for space. Um, and theaters have specific requirements. Uh, high ceilings, if you can get them, a total blackout, um, and also all the stuff that's involved in getting an occupancy permit. And we were thinking we needed 100 seats. We had no money. So I was going to have to raise it. So I gravitated south of market, obviously, which where there might be something in our price range. And at this time, I was also producer for the Lyceum Theater. Can you hit that? Thank you. Anybody remember the Lyceum? Well, okay, the old Lyceum Theater, which prior was the Hollywood Burlesque Theater, uh, right? Exactly, run by the legendary jo Bob Johnston, whose Palace Bar was in the original Horton Grand and was in this hotel when it first opened. And the old Lyceum was demolished for Horton Plaza, by the way, but thanks to the efforts of Dan Pearson here, was replaced with the Lyceum Theater that's now in Horton Plaza. That's a whole other story. 
Um, but for now, gas lamp developer Jim Schneider, do any of you remember Jim, was the guy behind the Lyceum Theater. He was also the lead investor in the Keating Building, and he was the one that uh, had the Lyceum, and I uh, approached Jim. Uh, we had a show called the Lyceum Follies going there, and I approached Jim and said, uh, um, I, I was looking for space. So we arranged a meeting, and that meeting took place behind the Keating Building on July 18th of 1979, and Jim showed up, and I showed up with Willie and Bobby, and Dan Pearson was there, because Dan was the finance officer for the gas lamp, okay? And uh, we all met back there, and Willie, my partner <laughs> Willie, was a very colorful and very flamboyant guy, and, uh, that, and everybody who knew and loved him always was doing imitations of him. So Willie, of course, sidled right up to Dan and said, oh, I'm going to stand over here next to the money. <laughs> <laughs> And so he did. And so we put the full court press on for Dan to um, help us find a space. And um, Dan did. A lot happened really fast after that meeting. Dan found the space at the Pacifica Hotel. Can you pass? Yeah. And there we are. Yeah. That's the Bakta family who still owned the Pacifica Hotel, right? And uh, we signed a lease with Mac Bakta and his family there at Dan's office in the Keating Building. I got a $25,000 donation from Laura Kerr, who was a local philanthropist, who loved what we were doing. And we worked with Wayne Donaldson to design the theater to code and to historic code and begin renovation. Um, this was late in 79. And at that time, the only attractions south of Market were the Goodwill and uh, the Rescue Mission. And way, way, way down on 4th Avenue, like a beacon in the darkness, was cost plus, <laughs> right? And it was dark. It was literally dark. There were no street lights. There were, the sidewalks were crumbling. But you know, the area and its lovely old buildings and its fellow scrappy pioneers, well, it felt like the future to us. So other things happened fast as well. Dan and I became a couple. And along with my then 12-year-old son, Brian, we moved in together into two of the high-ceiling Victorian rooms at the Grand Pacific Hotel, which Dan and his partners had purchased. And it was a single occupancy hotel, and we all shared uh, the bathroom and the shower facilities with fellow residents. It was quite an experience for my son and for all of us, but it was a memorable experience, one I would never trade. And then to raise the rest of what we needed to open the little theater, we did fundraisers and went calling on gas lamp property owners, and we found support from enlightened gas lamp pioneers. And I want to remember at this moment two who are departed but gave us so much, Maury Slayen and Bud Fisher, who were, gave us office and rehearsal space and advice and counsel and financial support. So, also Whoopi Goldberg. Um, this was before she was well known. Whoopi did a fundraiser with her partner Don Victor there on the ground floor of the Grand Pacific. All right, and um, so in May of 1980, we opened, can you go forward? We opened uh, the Gas Lab Quarter Theater. And that's not a great shot, but up above is before and after. And it was a really, really good show that got really, really bad reviews, and it was a big flop. Uh, and I should mention that my significant other before this meeting with Dan was the head theater critic at the San Diego Union Tribune. <laughs> so that breakup reverberated throughout my theatrical career, I have to say, but enough said about that. That's a whole other talk, OK? So, so unlike other small theaters at the time, we, um, we were committed to paying our actors, so we had overhead. And people were afraid to come down here. Um, we sometimes had more people on stage than in the audience, literally. And we had issues with street people. We had a raggedy guy with a push broom walk through the door of the stage, this, of the hallway that led back into backstage, and actually walk directly right onto the stage. <laughs> and it was in the middle of a performance. <laughs> and so fortunately, it was theater of the absurd. And so and the whole, <laughs> the whole cast just played it off and kind of marched him off stage and went on, on with the show. And the show was a flop. And seeing that I was despairing, and I was wondering if I'd done the right thing, Don Wartman, who had produced the Lyceum Follies, uh, he was a legendary theater impresario, and he had hired me as his associate producer there at the Lyceum, really believed in me, and he was a major mentor. He came to me and said, look, Kit, we're going to do a musical here. We're going to do a musical, and we're going to pack them in. And he suggested the 1937 Rodgers and Hart classic, Babes in Arms. 
and it's full of hit songs and tapping feet, and there were, but there were 18 people in the cast and numerous set changes. We had a dressing room for eight people and virtually no backstage. Don said trust him, and I did, and we went into pre-production. Babes in Arms opened in 1979. It was one of the hottest San Diego summers on record. We had no air conditioning. <laughs> There were 18 people on stage tapping and sucking up every ounce of oxygen there was in the place. And the cast had to take turns getting into the dressing room and they were squeezed in like sardines in the backstage waiting to, to enter. And we literally, literally had a couple of oldsters pass out in the audience. And it was really scary. Um, but we built it and they came. It was a big hit. And my mom and my son ran the box office and concessions and they were happily going crazy. And while it was tough, Drawing an audience out the market, we now saw it was possible. We produced three more shows in that first year, including Whoopi Goldberg's one woman show that went to Broadway. And Whoopi and I would meet in the box office every night after and sit there and have a shooter or three <laughs> and, uh, and divvy, up the, divvy up the proceeds 50-50. The audiences were small and Whoopi wasn't known yet in Lower Fourth. It was spooky at night. Our marketing budget was non-existent. And although our work was top quality, we really struggled to get on the map. And then in January of 1981, tragedy put us in the spotlight. We opened a musical early in January called Rare Wines, and it was a, Don Wartman created it. And it was a, a collection of great show tunes from lesser known musicals with a stellar cast, including Bob Johnston's daughter, Deanne Johnston, and, um, Daphne Ashbrook, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you, you know her from that. And we'd been running a week and the ticket sales were really promising. And then I got a phone call from a reporter at the Union Tribune who said, hey, did you hear? And I said, no, I, what? He said, Don, who had family in San Bernardino, kept an apartment there, um, had been found dead in his apartment under suspicious circumstances, possibly a homicide. He wanted to do an interview with me and talk about Dawn, and I was deluged with calls um, and TV and newspaper interviews. And as we canceled that show and we grieved the loss of Dawn, our name and our face got out there big time. And in my darker moments, I accused Dawn, whose <laughs> life was all about filling seats, of a really, really bad publicity stunt. <laughs> well, we had to close Rare Wines, obviously, and move on with the rest of our season. And while it was still a struggle, we were gaining traction. The gas lamp was slowly coming to life. We were building a board. I'd quit my job at the Union Tribune. It was full-time producing at the theater now. And I performed in one show a year. And in 82, it was Noel Coward's naughty 1925 comedy, Fallen Angels, about two British wives getting drunk, admitting to premarital sex, and contemplating adultery. <laughs> sort of a real housewives 20 style. <laughs> And there we are, and I am brilliant uh, San Diego actress and producer Rosina Whittison Reynolds, if any of you are theater goers know her, played these two debauched wives, and no one could do coward like Willie Simpson. And the show was a big hit, and we kept extending it. And the only thing was, a few weeks into the run, Dan and I got the joyous news that I was pregnant. And so we ran off to the courthouse between a matinee and an evening show <laughs> to get married. And uh, my mom left her post at the box office to come and witness it. And as the show went on and we were happy with the extension, my costumes kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, also, here's the deal. We, we drank a lot of faux cocktails in that show. And you know, when you're pregnant, that's to be an issue, drinking a lot of liquids. And I, every, every, every night at intermission, it was a desperate race between me and the audience to get to the one ladies' room that we had. And, and then coming out of it, you know, in the theater, we always say you're not supposed to break the fourth wall. And that's that invisible wall that separates your reality from the audience. But obviously, that was blown big time when I would come out and there would be a whole line of people there waiting. And hey, I mentioned that my mom and uh, my son Brian ran the box office, and they did so very, very professionally. And I want to just share a, a, a memory that Brian, my son Brian at 13, had Saturday box office duty. So he'd come down every Saturday, 
He'd go get himself a sandwich up at the Golden West Hotel, um, take a little break. And anyway, they had tours that came around on Saturday. You know, they, volunteers would bring the tours around. They'd be in Victorian garb, and they'd bring, them into, bring the group into the theater because it was a point of a, attraction. It was an old Chinese dance hall. And they'd sit down in the seats, and my son Brian would layer up with T-shirts from all the shows. And he'd get up on the stage, and stand up there and say, well, this, we did this show, and he'd take off the shirt, and we did this one, and this one, and this one, then he would pitch him, for, uh, pitch him to come in and buy subscriptions. So that was, my, that was my bry guy. So, in 1984, with four seasons under our belt, growing board, growing donor base, growing audience, Dan's brainchild of the Horton Grand Hotel, reconstruction was emerging, Horton Plaza was on the horizon, the convention center was just beyond. Started thinking expansion. And we were still struggling mightily to make ends meet, though, on 96 seats. And it was necessary to increase our revenue potential to survive and grow. And like most nonprofit theaters, our revenue from the box office only took care of about 50% of our ticket sales. And there was another significant factor that happened in 1984 uh, and that propelled us forward. And her name was Patty LaJoy. Now, Patty Kramer, she's here tonight. And Patty had just sold a very significant, very successful business. And she was looking for her next passion, for her next quest. And she heard about Gaslamp. And we connected. And she loved what was happening in Gaslamp. And she shared the vision. And she signed on as our development director, something I'd never had and said she would spearhead a campaign to raise the funds for a second theater. And I thought, yeah, there is a God. <laughs> <laughs> and in those late night discussions with Patty, and yes, there may have been a bit of wine involved, the embryo of the Horton Grand Theater was conceived and began to gestate. Sort of a two mommies scenario before it was in. Right? <laughs> so 1984 was also the year my mom, who was so much a part of the theater story, passed away. Also, at that time, there was a lot of contention between the gas lamp, we were talking about this earlier, between the gas lamp and Horton Plaza, uh, how its eastern perimeter would interface with gas lamp. And we would, um, Dan and I were both on the, uh, on the board of the Gas Lamp Quarter Association, and we would have these meetings and negotiations with the Horton Plaza team and with Ernie, and they were intense and they were heated. And um, at as association board members, we participated, and someone I remember at that time likened the gas lamp board to junkyard dogs. <laughs> and I remember thinking that that was a term of endearment. Anyhow, CCDC, the redevelopment agency, decided to plan a roast uh, of Ernie Hahn. And they thought it would be really funny, given all of the contention, if uh, I put together a roast. And so that was when I met Ernie Hahn. I, I put something pretty wicked together. And uh, I socked it to Ernie real good. And he gave it right back. We had a lot of fun and we connected. And Ernie took an interest in what we were trying to do. And we shared with him the vision of a second theater. And he became an advisor and a friend, a mentor, a powerful supporter, a board, advisory board member, and ultimately the theater's namesake. Ernie called us the Marines. He said we were down there in the trenches keeping the, the hostile forces at bay. In late 1984, we committed to building a second larger theater. We would be producing uh, shows in both spaces, so it, they needed to be close. And there was a building that called to us. And it was uh, just south of the island, next to the site where Dan planned to reconstruct the hotel. And it was a dilapidated old brick building, and we found out it was the San Diego paper box factory. Now, our dream was to create a proscenium theater with a fly loft. Um, and the proscenium is a classic style of theater construction with the arch over the stage, okay, and with the audience pretty much in a unified view of the, of the, of the stage. And the fly loft is the area above the stage where you can raise and lower, or fly as we call it, scenery. And the, this is different, say, from an arena stage, which is in the round, or a thrust stage, which is surrounded on three sides. We had a black box with the thrust stage at the Little Theater, and we wanted to be able to really create some sizzling, scenic uh, experience for our audience, and so we wanted to build it with a fly loft. And there hadn't been a theater built with a fly loft 
uh, in San Diego in several decades. It's a very vintage way to build a theater, and that's what we wanted. So the paper box factory building was owned by a bank, and Dan reached out to them, arranged for us to take a look, and uh, it was Dan, Willie, and Bob, our theater director and designer, who are also architects, and Wayne Donaldson, and Patty Kramer, and our board president, attorney Joe Fish, and I. And um, we walked into that building, and the energy inside was powerful. It, um, the walls of that building welcomed us. And for those of you who are into old buildings, I think you know exactly what I mean. So. We decided that was our spot. And we started making the rounds of all the people and agencies that had a buy into the dream. The folks at CCDC in the city gave us their blessing and in concept. And Willie, Bob, and Wayne began to uh, get into a deep dive about design. And now we were where the rubber meets the road on such projects. And that's funding. And the building needed to be purchased and the theater needed to be built and operated. And so we needed to raise close to two million for construction, which is an incredible bargain by today's standards. Um, but, and then several hundred thousand for the operating budget. And under Dan, uh, Dan's leadership, so a partnership was formed to buy the building and it consisted of some people from the hotel that were owners of the hotel and some gas lamp property owners and some theater supporters. And, um, the theater's nonprofit corp would, build, would pay to build the space and lease it from the investors. And the investors, because the building was over 40 years old, would get a tax credit um, and a 20% tax credit because the old bricks were going to go back onto the facade. And there was a tax credit for that. The only thing is that, um, so that tax credit was going away in 87. So in order for the investors to be able to realize what we promised them, we had to open the theater by midnight, December 31st, 1986. So then it was time for me and Patty to go out and find the money. And we, um, we needed a chunk right away to pay for the construction costs and, and uh, to our MH Gold and our contractor have them break ground because now we had a big deadline. So the Kit and Patty show went on the road. And uh, people may have wanted to run when they saw us coming. They did, as a matter of fact, but they knew, they knew what we were after, but they knew there was no place to hide. <laughs> right, Patty? And we were ready, and listen, we were ready to put donors' names on everything in the theater. We were talking about that earlier. So, you know, every last piece of the theater, we would have put it on the biffies if, if they'd have wanted it. Your name on a seat in the theater, Mrs. Copley's name on the alley, your name on a brick in Copley Alley. Um, we sold seats. Um, and we had a beautiful piece of black marble in the lobby with an engraving tool. And so when our donors would come, we would make a big fuss during intermission and have them sign the marble. Uh, and we had fundraisers, and including one very memorable one, and it was kind of a, a, a seminal thing for the gas lamp. Ernie Hahn sponsored it, Horton Plaza sponsored it. It was called the Celestial Fantasy. It was a black tie affair in 1985. And it was chaired by an iconic San Diego arts activist, Polly Pewterbaugh. Some of you may remember Polly. And it was held in the warehouse at Fourth and Island. And remember, this is 85. It was held in the warehouse at Fourth and Island where Dan um, and had stored the dismantled Horton Grand the uh, Hotel. And he and Billy Riley, fabulous Miss Billy, had created a mock-up Victorian room so that they could show investors what they were, what, what they were doing. And guests, guests were told they would be picked up at the U.S. Grant in Cinderella carriages. We couldn't really tell them where they were going because they probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have come. So we said, don't worry, we're going to pick you up at the Grant in these carriages and take you to a mystery destination, and then we'll take you back in the carriages. And we, I remember watching some of the faces as they got out um, there at, for, at fourth, and, um, fourth and Island. But... Inside, we had created this heavenly, gauzy, stunning, dreamlike scene in the meal, in the food, in the entertainment. It was all world class, it was all elegant. And for us, it was a metaphor and a foreshadowing of the transformation that awaited the theater and the hotel and the district. So our major, our major naming ace in the hole was the theater itself, if you can advance it. 
So our beautiful Broadway-style marquee, this was, this was the biggie. And we offered it to Ernie Hahn because he had done so much for us. And Ernie, in typical fashion, in our experience with him, um, they weren't really into being recognized for what they did. And um, he figured it, it was a really great opportunity for us to go out and find a new, somebody new and, and leverage this opportunity for some more funding. So um, our, our investors were counting on the tax break. We had to get going. We needed to keep the coffers flowing and enter Charlie Dean, a Rancho Santa Fe businessman and recent New York transplant whom Patty met. And as always was her way, she thoroughly charmed him. And he needed recognition and status in his new corner of the world. And we needed a commitment. Patty got it. He gave a piece up front and signed a pledge to pay the balance when certain benchmarks were met. We took his pledge to the bank, got our construction financing that we needed. We put his name up on the marquee. We were jubilant. Charlie was invited onto the board and we headed for the year end deadline of 1986. And did we make it? Well, perhaps the best way to share this piece of the story is to read a few excerpts from the LA Times article dated January 3rd, 1987. The headline, Gas Lamp Stage Beats Tax Clock. <laughs> and I quote from the article, on Monday night, December 29th, the Gas Lamp Quarter Theater christened its new Dean Theater with a raucous vaudeville review and in the process preserved its investors' income tax credits. The often outlandish review, written by the theater's business manager, James Strait, triggered guffaws from the well-heeled crowd and was a real benefit to the group of investors, a limited partnership. Because the new theater is a reconstruction of a 75-year-old building, the facade was rebuilt from original bricks and it qualifies for tax credits. In the theater's debut, a rare ensemble of civic leaders, arts patrons, construction workers, and actors joined forces for the review. By turns, irreverent, these are words that reviewers like to use, irreverent, self-congratulatory, corny, clever, and naughty, it was like a living scrapbook of the six-year-old gas lamp quarter theater. Developer and philanthropist Ernie Hahn, sitting in a director's chair, stenciled Cecil B. DeMille, served as a gracious and humorous master of ceremonies. One of the 15 acts was Councilwoman Abby Wolfsheimer, a member of the theater's board who donned a piff helmet and cockney accent. Wolfsheimer recited, Charlie Dean, the lovely lord of dusty brick dust, a send-up of Roger Kipling's poem, Gunga Dean. Clearly a newcomer to the stage, Dean also performed a duet called What Do the Theater Folk Do, based on the tune from Camelot. Asked how he was pressed into a performing before 250 people, Dean quipped, when Kit asks, you don't say no. <laughs> if only that was the case. <laughs> hmm. And I hit the stage, and it says here, Goldman hit the stage with most of the office staff whom she had strong-armed into the review. She, development director Patricia LaJoy, and another staffer twittered through the three little maids from the Mikado, then doffed their kimonos for chorus girl attire, <laughs> vamping through a sultry comic, hey, big donor, satirizing their own <laughs> success in fundraising. And also, while not part of this write-up, I have to say Dan got, took the stage with Billy Riley and sang, ah, yes, I remember it well, from Gigi. <laughs> and so, the Playhouse, now known as the Horton Grand, was born amidst much joy and hope. We came in on schedule and on budget. We still had major fundraising to do in eight shows to produce in 1987 in the two, in the two theaters. So we hit the benchmarks to trigger that pledge from Charlie Dean. And to our complete shock and dismay, he refused to honor it. And he went public with some very hurtful, false, and baseless claims about the theater as an excuse for reneging on his pledge. Uh, honestly, it was a very nasty, painful, toxic chapter for us, about which I'm not going to get into the weeds. But I will tell you that in the aftermath, we produced the play Little Foxes by Lillian Hellman. Maybe some of you know it. And I played the lead, Regina Giddens, the southern villainess. And every night in the scene, I, would, I got to say to my husband, I hope you die. <laughs> I hope you die soon. I'll be waiting for you to die. And I don't, didn't feel that way about Charlie exactly. 
Um, but he certainly did help me reach the emotional summit that I needed. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. So, on February 3rd of 1988, we renamed the theater the Han Cosmopolitan Theater. I'm sorry, it's not a, a better look at that. It took a full year of coaxing for Ernie and Jean to say yes. And the LA Times article about the renaming carried this quote from Ernie. Jean and I have never really gone for recognition. We remain anonymous with nine-tenths of our giving. The rationale given to Jean and me from the theater was that because we've been involved, it will be an encouragement to other people to give more support to downtown. We continue to produce at both theaters, but when the basement below the small theater in the Pacifica got leased to the Cafe Sevilla, um, well, there was a lot of flamenco music and dancing. And we, we, try, <laughs> we tried to prevail and tried to keep producing, but that sound kept wafting up. And to be frank, the Sevilla was a more lucrative tenant for the Bakhtas. And so we had to close up that shop. Like all the greatest plays, my chapter at the theater had a beginning, a middle, and an end. It had highs, it had lows, conflict, love, laughter, tears, transformation, enlightenment, and redemption. I left in 1992 to pursue other interests and turned over the operation of the theater to some of my colleagues there who did excellent work. And then a few years later, the Lambs Players, a terrific group from Coronado, took up residence there. And by that time, the Partners of the hotel had acquired the theater, and they renamed it the Horton Grand. Now, during my time there, we not only produced six seasons of plays, we produced many special events and performances, including the annual Streisand Festival of New Jewish Plays, which we did many, many years in a row, and the Young Playwrights Project. Our stage was also graced uh, by some pretty amazing people, Marion Ross, Steve Allen, Shelley Berman, Pam Greer, who starred in uh, Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune, uh, was a huge hit. Mercedes McCambridge and Nehemiah Persoff. Also, I have to say, um, I have to acknowledge there was a lot of romance in our theater on and off the stage. <laughs> we hosted an onstage wedding, and it was really a, a gas lamp love story um, of a brilliant beloved member of our pack, the late Dudley O'Neill's, and his soulmate who was gas lamp stained glass artist Kelly Freiberg. And she's also now departed. Dudley was the accountant for the <coughs> hotel. And he was a theater, a poet, a historian, and a Renaissance man extraordinaire. And that day, seeing he and Kelly unite was fantastic. I'm really happy I was able to step back into the theater, embrace the memories, and share all of that with you tonight. It's a great space and a great place an amazing journey, and I was truly blessed to be a part of it. I'd like to take just a minute and introduce my guests here tonight, because they're some very special people. This is Bruce Rogers, my wonderful guy of 18 years, and he's a heroic retired fireman. And because of all that's going on in California right now, just want to say thanks to all of your brothers and sisters who are out there uh, fighting. <laughs> right. And uh, Dan Pearson, who you all know, and his fab wife, Nancy Curran. <laughs> Patty Kramer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> who you've heard so much, and her partner in crime, Bill Waite. Yeah. And these two lovely ladies right here, Ingrid Nielsen and Linda Ibarra, who are high school classmates of mine, and who were down here at the very beginning supporting, bringing people down, enjoying our shows. And Linda is a superb photographer. And for the first really four or five years that we produced down here, Linda created a beautiful, um, um, a, a beautiful body of, of photos of all that we did. I didn't really do her justice on what you had um, tonight. So with that said, any questions? Questions? Comments? Yes. So, what was the relationship between the theater in Horton Plaza, the Lyceum, and the Horton Grand, or the Dean Theater? 
Well, the Lyceum, um, the Lyceum is run by the San Diego Repertory Theater. And to be honest, when, um, so what happened was the old Lyceum that you saw, the old 1914 Lyceum, was going to be demolished for Horton Plaza. And there was a lot of angst about that because we were losing a beautiful theater. And um, to be really honest, Dan <laughs> led the charge and said, we have to replace this theater. And at the time, we had an opportunity uh, my company had an opportunity to go in for it. But to be really honest, by 85, we just weren't ready to take, that, to take on a big, a big space like that and to do it justice. So we um, backed off, and, Dan, and we um, suggested to Dan that he talk to the folks at the San Diego Rep because they had been around a lot longer and had had more time to develop. And so Dan, I mean, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. <laughs> Dan, and that's what, so, so there really was no connection except we were all members of the downtown theater community and Horton Plaza um, was um, convinced that it would be in everybody's best interest to make space for a theater in, in the plaza. So did they open pretty much at the same time that the Dean Theater did? Yes, well, yes, uh, Horton Plaza opened in 85. And they were there. So yeah, we, they opened a little before we did. We opened in, on December 29th, 1986. Yeah. Good question. Was the California and the Balboa going at that time? The Balboa was decrepit at that time. You know, the Balboa, um, you know, I mentioned uh, Polly Pewterbaugh, who um, chaired our, our Celestial Fantasy fundraiser. Polly, Polly was responsible for so much good stuff, including she and I was actually part of it too, part of the initial effort to renovate the, the Balboa. But the Balboa was, um, had fallen on terrible disrepair and it was a real concern. It was an eyesore and it was a beautiful theater inside. It had, but it needed tremendous renovation and nobody was taking a, a, the lead to restore it. So the Balboa came much later. The Balboa really didn't get restored until maybe 10, or, 10 years ago. Huh? Yeah, good question. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't know that anything's really happening with the California theater. Well, I think they're going to build a condo building. Okay. Yeah. So when did it? Was it producing? No. It we, there's one that really stands out for because something really, really, kind of strange and awful happened in it. But um, we. We did a lot of English um, literature. Um, are you familiar with Alan Ackborn, the playwright Alan Ackborn, who writes just brilliant, wonderful literature? And we were doing his um, show, Woman in Mind, with Rosina, Widows and Reynolds, and just a fantastic cast. And it's a play about a, um, um, a, a woman who's married to an English vicar. And, she, and her life is very dull and very unsatisfying. And uh, she creates this family in her mind and they come to life because she wants a more exciting family. And it's a clash between and her, fam her fantasy family and the real family they actually end up meeting. And, and so in the midst of this, I remember sitting up in my, um, in my office, because uh, I had an office up there uh, in the theater that had a view to the stage and had um, speakers in the office so I could hear everything. So I could be up there working at night and watching the show and hearing what's going on. And all of a sudden I'm hearing the show and I'm not hearing what's supposed to be being said out there at all. <laughs> and I'm looking down and the character who was, uh, who's a wonderful actor, the guy, he, um, he had a psychotic break on stage. And so you can imagine he, he, he went into a break and started, um, st started going off. And the actors were trying to get him back and get him back into it. And um, we, we actually had to, and they, they managed to get him off stage. And the next night we had to have somebody go on with a script. And poor and Eric, we, you know, we w worked it out with him. And, um, but that, that, that's one that comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was a producer. So, you know, the, the, oh, but I'll tell you another one. You well, saw Pam. Yeah. Okay, so frequently a cast can cover up the error, but that way error was too big. It was. So the audience did know what was going on. The audience would have sensed that something was amiss, <laughs> but 
Um, actors, yeah, you know, some of the most exciting moments on stage are when things go awry. Yes. That's really sometimes the excitement of, of live theater. And <laughs> that was too much excitement, though. <laughs> um, yeah, and the next night we had to send someone on with a script. It was Navarre Perry that we had to send on in that part. That's a whole other story. And he, um, and we just explained to the audience what, that this is live theater and we, we want the show to go on. Um, so, but another, another one I have to tell you about that was um, so incredible was a show called Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune with, by Terrence McNally. And Pam Greer, whose picture you saw there, um, and a very fantastic San Diego actor named Bill Anton did that show. And it was really important to us because we, it was really hard for us to get the African American community down um, to see our shows and we were really you know, wanting to do that. And when we got Pam Greer into town, we really opened up to a whole new, whole new audience. And it was a very sexy show and it was a very powerful show about a waitress and a cook a uh, couple of kind of loser types who, and it opens up with Chopin and a big love scene. And Pam stayed here at the at the Horton Grand. She's a b pretty big star. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the Jackie Brown movies, but she, you know, she's a terrific actor. Uh, so that was really, we had something bad happen outside. Again, we were, you know, we're down, we're down here. And I remember one night going to Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune I was there to watch the show and hearing screaming outside and went out and there was a stabbing going on on the sidewalk that we were able to actually stop. But th those kinds of things happened. Um, and all of, the, um, all of the Noel Coward shows that we did, I mean, we were, English comedy was a real, uh, was a, a real, it um, was really in our wheelhouse. Uh, and we enjoy that. You know, that brings to yeah. mind something else. Um, when you ask about shows that, remember, we, um, during the second season, we did Tennessee Williams' Sweet Bird of Youth. And, and I played Alexandra Del Lago. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and in that show, you know, again, it's a, it's a very sensual show. And I was wearing like a satin nightgown. And um, well, two things happened during that show. First of all, the guy that, I, that was playing my, my lover and I were not connecting. And I remember Dan saying, you've got to take him out to the park and get to know this guy somehow and make something happen. I remember we, that I was really, really scared. And we did do that. But also the other thing, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That came out wrong. <laughs> that came out wrong. We got to know each other because I was freaked out because I knew, Dan knew that the, uh, you know, when we opened a show on Friday night, the review showed up on Sunday morning. And we lived in Golden Hill at the corner of 26 and A, and I would get up at the crack of dawn, go up and get the paper. And Dan could usually tell by how I came back in the house, how, you the how I found the door, <laughs> what the deal was. Well, on that show, I, like I said, I had broken up with Welton Jones, and I'd been with him. He had been my significant other. And I, so now he was coming and reviewing my shows. And so here I was. And, and Welton was very supportive of me, by the way, in my, in, um, before I broke up with him, he was very, <laughs> very supportive of my theater career. But um, I, in, in Sweet Bird of Youth, I was out there like, and that theater, the little theater was tiny. It was not, 96 seats, but you were this close, okay? Yeah. And I was out doing my monologue and my, and Welton was right there and he was like, had his pad up and he was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was a little, that was a little dicey. Oh, yeah. And, um, and we, did, we did suffer from that a little bit. Um, yeah. Any, are you still acting? Am I still acting? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I am, but in a whole different medium. Um, when I left the theater, I started a, a, I looked around for, and I had my education background and wondered what, what would be best for my skill set if I wanted to move into business out of the arts. And um, I had some friends, actually, at the city of San Diego. I don't, any of you remember Kevin Munley? <laughs> um, and he introduced me to some human resources people. At, and because I was thinking, you know, theater would be a really powerful way to train. It would be a really powerful way to get it, information across, to bring it to life. And so I, t he, so I talked to some human resources people. And yeah, they, so that was uh, 1994. And since then, I, I have a company called Workplace Training Network, and we, we go out and train in the workplace on such things as harassment and discrimination and workplace violence, and we do it using theater. 
And that's how we do it. We lay out the info and then we um, perform. So I'm acting all the time, uh, but it's in a more of a, of a conference room setting, which is really a lot of fun because you're this close. I don't, uh, frankly, a lot of the people that see us perform now would never set foot in a theater. And so they're getting their first dose of live theater in that, in that venue. Ah, well, that came off when, um, when it became the Horton Grand Theater. So when the partners at the hotel, very good question, and that made me sad, you know, to see his, his name go down. But hey, everything changes and evolves, and it's a world is a changing place. So, um, and Ernie was gone by the time it came down, so he never had to experience that. So. Um, yeah, so when the, th when the hotel ownership took it over, and it made sense to call it the Horton Grand Theater. Yeah. Any other uh, questions, thoughts, comments? Well, thank you, Chris. My pleasure. <laughs> I'm really wired up here. <laughs> oh, a little gift for you. Oh, thank you, Rhiannon. Thank Rhiannon. you so much for sharing your story. It was Wonderful. Oh, thank you. It's such a delight to do it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for coming.